Welcome, everybody, to Big and Robot Presents Entertaining Guests. Today, we're going to be speaking with comics professional. Is that, a, is that an accurate uh, appraisal of your, your job, Blake? <laughs> comics professional? I guess you could say that. Um, probably more, more along the lines of writer right now, but uh, I'll take that. <laughs> okay, well, writer and comics professional, Blake Northcott. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank hey, you guys welcome. so much. Yeah, thanks for com- thanks for uh, coming on and being with us and sitting down to have a little talk. So uh, we appreciate your time and uh, look forward to finding out wonderful things about your experiences and and things as being a writer and a, a comics a purveyor. Well, not a purveyor of comics, but a uh, creator of comic books is which is something that we love. So right, yeah. oh, I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so you uh, are currently working for Aspen Comics under mm-hmm. on the title Fathom, um, but you said you're not working so much as comics, but you're also just a writer in general. What what other things are you working on at the moment? Um, well, currently I have a book that uh, a new novel that I finished, and I'm going through the editing process. So that should hopefully be out in the next year. Uh, I do have an agent that I'm kind of working with on that. So that's kind of my big project that will be coming up. But right now I'm set on finishing the eight-issue run with Fathom. So it's been wonderful and a really great experience. And I love working on this book. So it's been wonderful. Awesome. Is it it going to be going past the eight issues or is this just a finite uh, series? This current uh, Michael Turner's all new Fathom is going to be the, just the eight issues. Uh, I haven't uh, gotten into discussions with Aspen yet about what will happen going forward. I'm sure they have plans, you know, um, right. what they want to have happen with this series. But right now, I'm just working on the uh, first eight issues. Cool. Well, how how many have been released so far? They've had it going back all the way to 2000. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Just in just in this series. Excuse oh, me. Oh, this series. So right now yeah. I'm currently writing number seven, but um, oh, okay. it's already up to number five. It's come out um, in the store. So you can go to your comic book store and pick them up there. And there's also a whole bunch of variant covers that have come out. So it's been really fun that way. Oh, yeah. There's been yeah. a lot of really neat variant covers for sure. Yep. Oh, yeah. So the uh, art is beautiful. Yeah. I guess since we're talking a little bit about that, why don't you tell us what, what Fathom is about? I mean, I, I went and read a little bit about it, but, but I feel like you'd do a better job explaining it to our audience. Okay, sure. Um, so Fathom has a long-standing history, you know, going back a long time. It was created by Michael Turner. Mm. So Fathom is about a superhuman uh, who can control all aspects of water. She's from an undersea race called the Blue, who have existed in secret, sort of without the knowledge of the human world. And while she works as a marine biologist on the surface, she's also also torn between humans and the Blue world. And this sort of leads to both political and personal issues for her. So in my run on Fathom, um, in this series that I'm writing, there's a new undersea race that's discovered. And as she tries to keep them from attacking the surface, she's accidentally exposed. And her identity is leaked on the internet. Uh-huh. So this is kind of like the hook for mine. <laughs> this, this sends the human and the blue world into this tailspin. And, you know, as you can imagine, like all kinds of craziness ensues. So, yeah, so that's what it's about. Cool. Cool. So how are you? Uh, how are you doing? How are you guys doing numbers wise on the book? Is it selling pretty good? Good reception? Uh, as far as I'm aware, yeah, there has been. I mean, a lot of people have said, um, you know, I've been to my store and I'm looking for it. And it's not on the shelf. So I think what's happened is a lot of people have put it on their polis because mm-hmm. they've only ordered and maybe enough to cover the polis. And then there's a couple of extra. And then a couple of people have said, I wasn't able to get it. So I'm hoping it comes out in a trade paperback. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping mm-hmm. a lot of pick up the trade after but but yeah as far as I know it's selling well is it available uh, digitally currently or not yeah yeah you can pick it up uh comiXology has it there excellent excellent that's great that's great i mean that's i mean that's huge i mean you know the, the whole digital thing as far as comics goes obviously it just makes them that much more available to uh, potential customers and fans so yeah oh, that's fantastic sure. yeah yeah i think it opened it up to kind of a new uh wider audience which is great yeah for sure for sure yeah, especially in Europe, maybe even there's some people who have said they weren't able to get out to their local comic store, so they they get it that way digitally, and uh, I think that helps them. How we usually start these things out is we we kind of want to get to know you as a creator, 
and you know get to kind of start at the beginning so to speak you know tell tell us a little bit about yourself blake but uh um how uh, did you read comics growing up or is this kind of a new thing for you was it was that ever a component of your of your early life uh yes i mean i was always interested in reading and literature my whole life you know, I, I, I would have to say I started out reading more poetry and novels, and then I got into artwork, and I, I did definitely, throughout my teenage years, get more interested in comics. Um, so there's been that that kind of love of the written word going back for me for a long time. And, you know, I would sit in my room and write, you know, poems and enter contests and things. Plus, when I was growing up, my mom was engaged to a Japanese man. So she ended up taking me and my sister t- to live in Tokyo for a little while. So I went to school there, and I think that had a really big impact on me, um, kind of opened me up to, you know, where maybe a lot of my nerdiness comes from. <laughs> I okay. love the comics and the animation from there and the manga and everything. So that was kind of in my, uh, my informative years, where I was around 12, 13, 14, that, that kind of shaped my interest in that, in that area. You said that when you were growing up, you were doing a lot of reading and writing. Now, well, now I'm curious, when teachers would ask, or teachers or grown-ups would ask you what you want to be when you grew up, would you say writer or, or do you think you want to be something else? Do you want to be an astronaut or? No, I would say I always had such a love of the written word that I knew I wanted to do something with writing. Uh, you know, I set my course kind of to go to university. I have a bachelor's degree in English literature that I got when I went to McMaster University. Mm -hmm. So I knew going through even my schooling that it was something I wanted to end up doing. I wasn't sure at that point exactly what I would end up writing. I kind of always thought I'd love to be a travel feature writer, you know, to be traveling around the world writing art. That sounds good. That didn't end up happening, but that's okay. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, you you traveled. I mean, you went to Japan. That's a pretty big thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exciting, but I'm, I'm assuming that influ- that that had a pretty big influence on your life and potentially in your writing in some some degree. Oh, for sure it did. And mm-hmm. uh, you know, when you're when you're young like that, you get exposed to different cultures and you know, being able to travel around, it really made me uh, open my eyes to a lot of things in the world that I wanted to explore more about. And being able to go to school, I was lucky enough to be able to get my degree. So I ended up getting a job actually right out of school, but it was in insurance. It was not anything. <laughs> It was nothing to do with my um, degree. So, you know, it was a job that just paid my bills. And I was kind of working that way for uh, a couple of years and I stuck with it. But then I started getting the writing bug and it just, you know, it wasn't my dream job. So I decided to start writing a short novel at that point called Versus Reality. And it was doing well on Amazon, you know, but it certainly wasn't breaking any records. And there came a period of time where I just decided to just pursue writing full time and see if I could make a living. So that's what I decided to do. Okay. Well, let's let's back up a little bit before we get too much into that into that stuff. Um, uh, when you were a kid, what uh, what types of books did you read? Like, what what uh, what appealed to you as far as like uh, literature and such? Was there, or were, more specifically, let me let me rephrase that a little bit. More specifically, were there any uh, were there any writers that appealed to you when you were growing up that you're like, oh, I gotta, you know, like because I know like some people are like, oh, you know, Stephen King, he he's my guy, you know, or like who who was that for you? Like what, what was what was the thing that really kind of got you when you were younger on? Well, when I was very young, I mean, I read through a lot of the classics. Um, I I loved Margaret Atwood. We have some Canadian writers here. Um, that are very influential that we see, you know, in all the bookstores and everything. So Margaret Atwood was a big one. Um, I did really like enjoy reading in my university days, I should say, The Mists of Avalon, kind of things that had to do with like Arthurian legends. Mm. Uh, I really enjoyed those books so much. Uh, I also really liked The River God. And I really enjoyed reading another book, um, Irving Stone's The Agony and the Ecstasy, but a biography at the same time of um, the life of Michelangelo. And that really influenced me. I just love that book so much. So I I don't know. I had kind of a wide variety of different things I was reading. Um, But yeah, I, I would just, anything I could, I was always the dork who stayed inside and was more reading books than outside you know, doing sports. So uh, <laughs> you, mean, you mean a good Canadian girl and you didn't play hockey? I mean, come on now. No, I did not. Really? Well, uh, well, hold on. I think I think I got to ask a question that I like to ask just about all of our yeah. guests because you, you sort of you sort of dipped your toe into it, Blake. 
So a lot of people, you know, they get known for their job or maybe they do a particular work and they get known for that. And on Interesting Guests, we kind of like to let people just feel kind of casual. And one of my questions is, you know, who were you growing up? Were you more like, were you a class clown? Were you more of a loner? Were you an extrovert? Were you an introvert? You know what I'm saying? And I think you were kind of kind of going in that direction without even knowing that was a question. Yeah. I mean, I was, let me think about this. I mean, I, in, you know, in grade seven, grade eight, I was on, on my school junior high cheerleading team. Mm-hmm. So I did cheerleading, you know, some gymnastics and things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I definitely did like figure skating. So I had some interest in hobbies and things like that and always had friends. But I was definitely a big reader. I would I would love to sit inside and read books all day, you know. Nice. So my mom would have to push me and be like, okay, you have to go outside. You have to get out there, <laughs> you know, get some sun. So that's why, like, I am super white and pale because I just like to, to stay inside and read. I always love libraries. And I found that really um, when I was going through my bachelor's degree. I really loved going to the piece of the library and getting to read and just – enjoy the books that way. I was a pretty calm girl that way. <laughs> Definitely. So we we were going through, you know, some of the info about you online and stuff, trying to find some interesting tidbits. And there you would, I think uh, it was on your, you have an IMDB page of all things, uh, which is always fun, which I, I, I jokingly say that's my one goal in life is just to have an IMDB page at some <laughs> point. <laughs> so I'm jealous in that regard, just right out the gate. So, uh, but said on there, you got, published when you were 11 in 17 magazine uh yeah. and i i would be remiss if i were not to ask you about this because t- i know there's got to be a story there there's got to be something there. Yeah, so, yeah for sure i mean that was probably my i would say one of the um defining moments in my desire to be a writer because it took it to a level where i did i wrote a poem it was actually about my mother for uh, a contest they were having um, running in Seventeen magazine. Uh, And, you know, that's like an international publication. So when you're a young girl, like all my friends would read this magazine. You could pick this thing up basically in any store, any supermarket. It was on every shelf. So it was a big deal because they did publish it with my name. And, you know, I got a free subscription to the magazine. And it was a big deal for me because it showed me how influential it can be to have your name in print to see your own writing in print and have it be recognized in that way definitely made me feel like, wow, you know, this is something that could really, I could do this. I feel like I could do this as a career. And it just gave me a sense of maybe a little bit of support and encouragement that I needed when I was deciding, you know, like, what should I do with my life? And I really, I I mean, that is something for me that was like an accomplishment at um, that age because it made me feel proud of myself. So Oh, yeah. Rightfully so. Rightfully so. Yeah. <laughs> I was I, like, I had something similar happen to me when I was growing up. It was, um, but it was just a school thing because you know I didn't read Seventeen magazine. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I was, I was more into Thrasher and skateboarding, Trans World skateboarding. But I had uh, for our school there was a like a national poetry contest thing, and I got published in some some kind of thing. I don't even. It's been so damn long ago. I don't remember what it is, but it definitely was one of those formative things. It's like wow, like you said, it's like it gives you that that kind of boost and you're like, this is, you know, this is a thing. This could be a thing. Yeah. Um, I haven't quite gone to the lengths that you have with it, but, and, you know, and applause for that. Congratulations on your success. Um, but yeah, no, I think that was, a, uh, I, I can imagine that had to have been a pretty inspirational moment for you. Absolutely. I think that's great. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think it shaped some of my, uh, you know, desire to be a writer professionally for sure. Right. So it was a, it was a poem about your mother. Is that what it was? Yeah. Cool. Right on, man. What was the uh? And you, you what was you won a, a subscription in the magazine? Was it like a lifetime subscription or just a year? <laughs> oh no, <laughs> <laughs> it was just for a year or two just or something. Year? And oh. yeah, but it was exciting. Oh, that's super cool, man. That's you that's know, my mom cool. actually uh, took the page out and she framed it and put it yeah. on her dresser. She still has it there to this day, and she'll say, you know. Just remember going back to the you know your early days you got published when you were like 11 so she's been a good um source of inspiration that way for me too always um being supportive and you know right. oh but, she wasn't she wasn't saucy and be like hey you just remember you're for success you owe it to me uh, <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> all right so well here let me ask you it just kind of in in terms of um just to stick with the books theme again so well it's comic books what uh what comics did you read like uh when you were a kid uh, I would say I was a real image 
girl, like back in the 90s, you know, I really liked the, the Image comics. I read a lot of more things like Spawn, The Max. I liked The Max. You know, oh, yeah, Wildcats. I was a big Wildcats fan that Jim Lee did. Oh, for sure. You know, even going back to Fathom. I remember uh, Fathom back in the day. So there's, I was more of a an image girl, I would say. So I noticed that you tweet a bit about video games, and I was I was curious. Do you do you play a lot of games, Blake? Did you play them when you were younger? Um, I say I'm a mild gamer. I wouldn't be <laughs> considered like a, a hardcore gamer. I really prefer. I love my favorite thing is to play Nintendo games. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of a Nintendo um, advocate, I would say, with my gaming. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, welcome home, friend. You're, don't you're worry, don't worry. Here. We're not going to get political here. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I do a little bit of right gaming. On. Yeah, I, I, I saw you were tweeting out Breath of the Wild, and um, I very much enjoy it. And uh, myself and some friends got Scott a Nintendo Switch because <laughs> he had not played the Nintendo system in like a bajillion years. Yeah. So, if, so if, if we find, and I've never played a Zelda game before either. There you go. Breath and of the Wild was my first one. Yeah. Have you uh, beat Ganon yet? Oh, I haven't even gotten close. I'm still, I'm still digging stuff up out of the ground everywhere I can. I'm, okay. I'm all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you? It's addictive. This game, man. Like I start playing, and then I'm like, I'm only gonna sit here for like, you know, twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. And like, you know, an hour and a half later, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to stop, oh. stop, stop. So it's hard, yeah. It's hour I love- and a half. Wow, a whole hour and a half, huh? You know, you know what I did yesterday morning? I woke up and I was like, all right, I gotta, I gotta do some audio testing here because I got some new, new gadgets and things on, like a capture card and stuff. And I didn't realize it, but like I think it was five hours later, I was like, holy shit! I've been playing this for five hours. <laughs> well, she, well, she, she's a moderate gamer, Scott. She's a oh, moderate well, okay. gamer. She's not horrible and broken like us. Right. <laughs> No, if I played that long, I would seriously get nothing done. And yeah. uh, I have crazy deadlines I have to meet. So it's well, just it's a distraction, though. It is. I see, you know, how it's so addictive. and But it's fun. So, but you have, have you beaten Ganon, though? No, because you need the Master oh, Sword okay. to beat him, right? I don't have that yet. So I'm trying. I'm getting there. But we'll see. Well, well if you need any tips, we can help you get there. All right. No. <laughs> Yeah, Mark, Mark, the, our, our, our buddies, Mark and our other friends, they, they got me that as a birthday present. And I was just like, I'm, I'm just enthralled by it because open world stuff like that. Just it just like, I'm like, oh, this is it feeds that that little dopamine receptor in my brain. And I just I, I'm loving it, though. So, yeah, but good. yeah, you're, you're a Nintendo advocate, though. huh? What is what's your favorite? Uh, what's your favorite Nintendo game? Um, I'm like old school. That's also like seriously stuff like Mario Kart. I love Mario Kart. <laughs> like even Splatoon. I don't know, just stuff like that. Yeah, it's fun. Nice. Mario Kart I could play for like way too long too. I like racing games. That's why because I I drive too fast sometimes. So <laughs> is that part of me? <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll have to get you into the uh, the Mario Kart. Uh thing when we get that when that gets going whenever they drop the uh, the online functionality at some point so yeah that'd be cool yeah man yeah we're we're, we're probably well i i'm assuming at some point we will probably have some kind of uh mario kart friday night fights kind of thing lined up and you'd be more than welcome to come and join us for sure for sure yeah. okay thanks yeah scott yeah. has this idea he wants to go and rope all our poor guests into games <laughs> and then stream them <laughs> we'll see yeah, hopefully be totally maybe silly. maybe well, maybe not stream them, but just, you know, hang out and be nerds and stuff. So anyway, though, there's that. Um, so I guess you, you touched on it briefly with the uh, with your mother being engaged to a man and moving to Japan. And you have a sister. Is that right? Yep. yep. Just just the one. Yep. Oh, OK. So I guess what was, um, you, you know, sometimes I feel a little bit silly asking these questions, but it's kind of like we're trying to get to know you as a creator and like how you got to the place you're at. So what was what was life like for you growing up? Like, were you in a very supportive, creative environment? Or was it just kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, my parents are cool. Everything was good, whatever. Just kind of ho-hum. Because, you, you, you know, because some people have to overcome adversity to a certain degree to get where they were. And so we're kind of curious, like, what was, what was your, you know, your upbringing like as far as your family and such? Yeah, um, I mean, I did have some outlets where people in my family had previously like creative career. So my grandmother on my maternal side was a painter and she painted watercolors and she was quite 
she was quite good and she painted her whole life and she gave me like artistic lessons when I was growing up. So I did a lot of painting. Um, she actually went out to BC when she was uh, in her 20s and painted with the group of seven, which was a really famous, um, uh, in Canada anyways, that our top um, seven most famous painters. So and BC being British Columbia, I'm assuming. Oh yeah, sorry, in British Columbia. Okay, sure. So they were based out there and she went out there to paint when she was younger. And, um, you know, on her side, I also had a very famous author in our family where everyone kind of looked up to. So she wrote a book about settling life in Canada in the 1800s and she moved over here from England and wrote this book and it became quite famous and was actually taught in universities um you know out in Ottawa which is our where our main parliament buildings are and everything there's like a street named after her so my you know when I was growing up I always had in the back of my mind my family my family life was like it would revered the artistic side they they would always nurture the artistic part of that when we were growing up and that was exciting, you know, because it's, it gave me those ideas to be able to be a writer. I thought, well, this is something I could really do. And my, I mean, my grand, on my father's side, my grandfather was a bookbinder in Czechoslovakia before the war. So we did have a lot of, I guess, those type of uh, links back to literature and painting and the art, arts, you know, in my family. Right. Right. Uh, but the rest of my family didn't go in that direction you know, necessarily. I had a cousin who went to school to be um, a video game designer and everyone was oh, really? like, oh, wow, that's exciting, you know, and um, my mm -hmm. sister didn't go into anything like that. So it was just pretty much, uh, I felt always compelled to do something on in creative. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I did have a lot of support and backing to do that. And when I went to university, obviously my, my degree was in English literature. So I was kind of forced to study all the great <laughs> Sure, you know, right. yeah, that's yeah. a choice there. So huh. that's exciting. Okay. Well, and, and you know, and you kind of, you, you kind of got the, the next question, the follow-up question you just answered as, as well. So and how, the, how that kind of affected you growing up. No, that's great though, that you were in a, in a creative environment to foster that sort of thing. That's fantastic. Well, now I want to ask, did you ever have any like really lame jobs or just jobs <laughs> that were strange? And I, I, I like to ask this kind of question because I feel it really rounds a person out to have that kind of uh, work experience, whether it be retail or something. So many lame jobs. I can't even, I can write a list for you. Let's see. First, I, <laughs> I worked at McDonald's when I was in high school. Nice. I did that. I worked at Blockbuster Video. You know, oh, Blockbuster there you go. Video. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I'm a former <laughs> Blockbuster alum. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's go. where I got a big handle on movies, I would say, my years working there, because I had to put away all the movie cases, so I learned, like, all these movie titles. I yeah. got free movie rentals every weekend, because that's what you get when you work there. Oh, yeah. So uh, <laughs> I saw a shitload of movies. Um, yeah, I worked. I've, I've had so many. I was a camp counselor one year. Um, what else did I do? I've, I've done a ton of odd jobs, yeah. I mean, I think always being able to pay the bills is important, and especially when you're in a creative field. Oh, yeah. You kind of have to do whatever you kind of have to do to, to pay the bills, right? So, um, yeah. you know. Yeah, starving artist and whatnot. Yeah. Starving artist, yeah. You know, yeah, it, if you work at Blockbuster, you're definitely starving. That's for damn sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, so camp camp counselor. I feel like there's a story in there somewhere. Is uh, there? Am I wrong? Was it all just very pleasant and fine, and no kids got poison ivy, and like uh, <laughs> no buildings, no roofs collapsed with lots of rain or snow? No, no. It, we, I, mean, I only did it for a summer. It was like a summer job here because um, I was trying to make ends meet for university. Right, right. And, you know, I just wanted to do something a little bit that wasn't so corporate. Um, a lot of people were getting jobs. You know, the year before I'd had a, a work internship at my dad's company. So this time I thought I wanted to do something with kids and just have a fun summer. And it was really interesting. I really enjoyed it. The kids were amazing. And it gave me a, a good solid, you know, base of this is what it's going to be like when you're an adult <laughs> <laughs> kids are hard work man you know so uh it was uh it was eye-opening for sure but it was fun so you were a camp counselor so i mean you you you, you said you stayed inside a lot so uh, was that difficult or <laughs> <laughs> uh you know what the kids were amazing they were really fun and you know that was a long time for me uh ago oh my gosh now that's got to be like 
what, 15 years ago. So I don't even remember. I just remember them wanting to play like games and we did a lot of crafts. I'm very crafty. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of, you know, paper puppets and, you know, it was a, a program run out of the school gym, like for the city. So uh, it was just a city camp for the summer, but it was really fun. And it was just what I needed right then. It was right after actually my grandfather had passed away. Aww. And I just felt like doing something fun and engaging. And uh, so that's what I decided to do. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Nice, nice. Okay, so I guess uh, let's let's move on. Where are we at, Mark? Are we on schooling? So let's move on to that a little bit. You you, you talked about that briefly. Um and I, well, I guess you kind of already said that you, you had a good idea of what, what you wanted to do when you went to university as far as like your career path and such. Um, was there ever any kind of hesitations like, oh, man, I want to get a degree in English, you know, or, or, or what, was, what was the uh, proper degree that you ended up getting? I'm sorry. Yeah, I have a bachelor's degree in uh, English literature. And okay. I, I did have those feelings because a lot of people were going into the same type of career that I was going into. So if they were getting a bachelor's of arts, they were being teachers or they knew they wanted to get into, let's say, working at a publication or working at a newspaper. I didn't know exactly where I wanted to write or what I wanted to write or if I wanted to be a teacher or not be a teacher. So I just decided to do my degree based on what I kind of enjoyed the most. So I have, a, you know, my major was English literature. My minor was um, art history. And I said, <laughs> nice. I love that. So yeah, I studied those and then came out of that, gave me a good background, I think. I always, you know, enjoyed comics and writing. So while I was working my boring insurance job, uh, I just kind of had a an epiphany one day thinking I don't want to do this the rest of my life like I don't want this to be the end of my you know my creative my creativity was just fading away every day you get stuck in this rut of just becoming this corporate kind of person and it actually took me a little while once I was out of working for because it was a big bank that I worked for so it took me I'd say a year maybe almost two years until I f felt back to my full creative potential when I was you know Wow. Trans transitioning into this career really so. that long why why did why did it i mean and not to not to be too personal but why do you why did it take so long to kind of decompress from that was there i think because i was in it for 11 12 years oh oh, oh really oh okay i'm okay. there so yeah. uh, right out of school until you know i was i was ready i was just ready to be done with it so okay okay yeah we, right on, right we hear that kind of story with a lot of guests on on entertaining guests who managed to get some success yeah. being creative, but they say there's usually like a period where they're just, you know, they're trying to pay their bills, they're working a job, and just something inside them goes, I can't keep doing this. I have to do this other thing that just, just that just drives me. So yeah. congratulations on getting out of, I guess, well, I don't know if you've gotten out of the rat race, but congratulations on finding that thing that makes you feel good. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I should say, I guess this is a good maybe a point to talk about my book Arena Mode yes. because that is what really kind of spiraled everything into comics. I would say. Hold on, um, I got, I got, I got, I got to pick a little bone with you. And don't worry, it's not actually a bone to pick with you. When we were doing our research. Oh right, yeah. <laughs> it drove me a little nuts. We were doing our research because you know we want to make sure we can we can talk about the things you've worked on, and things you care about. Uh, yeah. We were reading about Arena Mode, and. I swear, every time it was described, it was described as like a graphic novel. I'm like, oh, I want to see what the art looks like. But of course, it's not a graphic novel. It's inspired by the ideas, I guess, from graphic novels. And you even have art from artists in it. But it, as I was trying to find it, I'm like, what, is this, what does this graphic novel look like? I can't find it. And then, yeah. eventually, <laughs> and then eventually I realized it's, the description was, was not exactly graphic mode. I digress. Please tell me about arena mode. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so okay, so when I was working my full time job in insurance, mm -hmm. um, I decided that it was time to end that, and so I wrote a novel called Arena Mode, which it was a sci fi superhero book that takes place in like a dystopian future, and I ended up kickstarting it, and this is what how it all kind of took off. It became you know like a number one bestseller on Amazon. I got nominated for awards, and this is when people really started no noticing me and taking note of my name. Um, and most people don't know, like, don't realize how close I was to quitting writing altogether. If Arena Mode had failed, I think I would have had no choice but maybe to give up and go back to insurance. So it was my, like, like big, you know, 
huge push to get into writing. So a few years later, I'd written three Arenamo books, and it became the most funded sci-fi series on Kickstarter. Um, and the book is unique, like you said. It's not a graphic novel, but because it's a 300-page novel, mm -hmm. I also decided that I was going to hire Marvel, DC, and Image artists to illustrate the characters in the book. And I included them as part of the Kickstarter package. So there's artwork in there by Steve McNiven, Dave Johnson, Barry Kitson, Mark McKenna, Rock Upchurch, Natasha Allegri, just to name a few. And I was, you know, so thrilled with how this turned out. So, yeah, it's um, something that was done on Kickstarter, but now um, the books are still available to be purchased on Amazon. Nice. Those are, yes. those are some heavy hitters you got there for the art department. Uh, how did that... How did that uh, shake out? Uh, uh, there's a story there. Well, uh, at the same time when I had written my first book, Versus Reality, is when I started going online and blogging and really getting into social media. Uh -huh. um, you know, I started growing small, like I had a small following, but people started taking note of my ideas on comics and entertainment in general. And I started branching out and networking a little bit. And that's how I um, ended up being friends online with people like, you know, Mark McKenna and Dave Johnson. And yeah. so it's like I started connecting with them as friends on a friend level, I would say. And, um, you know, once it came time for me to, to really do my first project with Arena Mode, and I had some people who were interested in working on, you know, can I just do this little, because the thing too was it, I, w I wasn't requiring a ton of, of um, work by any one artist. Right. So I think it was why I got so many people on board because they were like, oh, this isn't a huge project. I can do this in a, like maybe a week or a couple of weeks. It's not a big deal. It's not going to take like, you know, half a year for me to do this. So right. I think a lot more of the artists were willing to be a part of my project that way. Plus, once all the names started dropping, you know, they were like, oh, I know that guy. I'll be a part mm -hmm. of your mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Yeah, because I was going to say, you get Dave Johnson in there, and that, like, people's ears start to prick up. I mean, you said it, and I was just like, ooh, Devil Pig. I love Dave Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> no, I fucking love Dave's work, man. He is, he is aces. I mean, you know, awesome. he's, yeah, he's a great dude. Oh, my gosh, for sure. So, yeah, that's that's great, though. I mean, it's like, it's like, you were living the dream, basically, at that yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't, I, it was such an amazing creative thing to, to be in, to do the Kickstarter. Um, yeah. And it really opened a lot, a lot of doors for me, I would say, because people started to take note and they're like, wow, this is really selling. And, you know, Kickstarters are crowd, crowdfunding nowadays are definitely a, a way to reach a whole new group of people. I, I had a lot of um, help, I would say, too, from the network that I had developed on social media. Mm -hmm. A lot of those people were ex excited to read what I had to say and, you know, for my first books to come out. And so I had a lot of support that way, which was really nice. Nice. That's And that's a that's like just right out the gate you got. I mean, well, I don't want to say it was like overnight success because it obviously wasn't, but it, it's, you know, to, to the to the passive eye of the person who doesn't know, that's like, it looks like an overnight success story. Well, so, it wasn't. I was doing writing. Yeah. I'm going back to 2012. I did a lot of blogging and I wrote for CBS Man Cave Daily Online. Oh. I wrote for CBR. I wrote a couple of pieces for Verily. Comic book resource? Yes, yeah, sorry, comic book resource. Right. Sure. For those who don't know, yeah. Yeah, for anyone who doesn't know. Uh, I wrote a couple pieces for Verily Magazine, and that really helped springboard me into the industry a little bit, um, right. you know, talking about comics and comic book movies. What and was... from there, I also got to be friendly with um, Mark Miller. So he's my, one of my mentors, and, um, you know, I got to be – he actually asked me if I would be an ambassador for him to write in the back of all his comics to do his editorials. So that was where a lot of people – took notice where they hadn't there. Who's this girl? You know, she's writing all the editorials for Mark Miller. <laughs> right, right. And yeah, because he's another big name, obviously. Like people's ears again, they prick up when they hear Mark Miller's name. Yeah, for sure. And really quick, <laughs> what was what did CBS stand for? CBS Man Cave Daily. So it was part of the CBS family and they had okay. that as gotcha. Okay. Online. Yeah. So I would do interviews and things. I met a bunch of people. Yeah, I just wasn't kind of sure if that was an abbreviation like CBR. Uh it's part of the CBS family. Okay, well, we'll CBS is, is CBS, is that the Canadian broadcast system? No, it's an American. Yeah. Oh, is oh, it, oh it's the American that's CBS. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, right. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I don't, um, think it's, I don't think it's live anymore. I think they no? showed that part of the page, but it was part of CBS. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. 
Um, so yeah, you well you you know we're actually I was one of the questions I was going to ask next was uh, what did you do at Millar World but or Miller World um, and you basically told us that already well, so we can I, just got to skip if, past that if you don't mind uh, I don't have this on the question Scott but I I would like to talk to her a little bit about the uh, about writing yeah man do it obviously okay yeah so I, I've kind of begun to write a, a book or attempt to. But maybe if you wouldn't mind, uh, Blake, could you give some advice to people who might want to get into writing, you know, the thankless, tireless, frustrating work that is writing? Yeah. Um, okay. So general advice, ba- basically I will give you based on what I have learned from my mm-hmm. pitfalls and my success. Mm-hmm. Right. The pitfalls I've gone through, I have learned the importance of outlining. Outlining, outlining, <laughs> outlining. There you go. Spend. We we had this discussion last night actually. <laughs> yeah. Mark and I, sorry. Yeah. I would say spend two to three months at least if you have the time to make it a solid outline. You know, I've I've had so many issues with rewrites that have driven me crazy, just wanting to tear my hair out. Um, because I didn't put that time in at the beginning, and it just can save you so many hassles and so much heartache. I would say just take the time. Do the online classes, you know, read books about writing, become informed about it. Uh, it's probably also a really good, a good step. There's so many great resources now. I did a master class online, actually. Um, I took a master class from James Patterson, and it was excellent. It, it really helped, uh, I would say, refine a lot of the things that I was already kind of doing but wanted to become better at. Mm-hmm. And I actually entered his contest this year and became a semi-finalist in um, his writing in his writing contest. So I really learned a lot from the master class. Uh, and that's an online one you can take. So you don't even need to leave your house to do it. And uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so I think that will attract a lot of people. Just so, what, yeah, by the way. So study, work on yeah. the craft, make an outline. Yeah, the outline for sure. That's, 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 I mean, just a little, a little bit of an aside. When I was in college, people would struggle with papers, and I never quite understood why. And when I'd go and look at how they approach writing, they'd be like, oh, yeah, I have a couple hours before I need to go to bed for the class tomorrow that I have to turn the paper. And they would start working. I'm like, what are you doing? You don't even have an outline. It's like you make an <laughs> outline, and then you know exactly what you're doing. So even though you're freaking out because you have to, like, you didn't sleep because you, you knew you were going to procrastinate, Anytime that you're freaking out, you can look at your, your outline like, oh, wait, I'm right here in my process. And yeah. I just, yeah, I just think it's, it's outlines are great and it may sound nerdy and dorky, but everyone should do them because it's good for you. <laughs> yeah, it's good for you. And I mean, I think also reading a lot, like helps yeah, yeah. Like, the popular fiction, find out what's selling at the bookstore, you know, just go and look around, do your online research and, you know, you have to be marketable you have to be able to sell your book it's not just writing the book right so mm-hmm. i'm huge on the marketing aspect of it um that's you know that's also having the audience there is is important right knowing your audience who you're writing to who you're or rather who your work will be good for yeah yeah okay let me take the next thing here this is this is something uh, you know i wanted to ask because it, it seems like an obvious question but this is not by any stretch to you know the focus of why we're doing this though but you know you're a woman in the comics industry um which is uh i don't want to say i don't want to say you're like a unicorn but there is there it's it's definitely a it's well unless you like unicorns we can go with that that's fine yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) but i mean traditionally it's it's an industry that's populated by men um and i just you know without getting too political or anything like that because that's not really the point of why we do this but like what's what's the reception been like i mean you, you touched on it briefly before but like if you could kind of expand on that a little bit maybe kind of give us an idea of of how that foray into the world of comics has been for you yeah it's been terrible it's been really rough <laughs> right <laughs> really blake do you need us to go beat some people up <laughs> what did you do who was I it oh. all day long you have no idea no, it's, uh, no not, everyone's been amazing. Honestly, I don't really believe in that whole like, oh, you know, women can't get into comics or whatever. I mean, I think it's just if you're passionate about what you're writing about, people pick up on that. And I actually have a story. I did a, an imager post. I, I am, I'm an imagerian, so I go on there a lot. And I did a post about my books and I gave away a copy of Arena Mode for free mm-hmm. to everyone who wanted to download it. 
So I did this post and it ended up getting over a million hits. Okay. Damn. Now the post did not include a picture of myself, just okay. the book and also my name, Blake Northcott. Mm -hmm. So I start getting messages on my posting, um, you know, people congratulating me or saying, thank you for the free download. This is great. I love hearing success stories. I just wrote basically what I just told you about how I was doing this kind of crap corporate job that I hated. Mm -hmm. I got into mm -hmm. something creative. Now I love what I'm doing. So it was kind of like to, to bolster people who were in that, you know, because I get questions and comments all day from people who are just like yourselves trying to become writers. So I just wrote this post about it. And um, it was very interesting to me how many people that replied were like, hey, dude, that's <laughs> awesome. Way to go, bro. You're awesome. Like, I'm so like they thought literally that I was a guy. Yeah, because your, I, your name is unisex. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, that was really interesting to me. So I'd write them back and be like, tell them whatever I wanted to say. And at the end, I'd say, P.S., I'm a dudette. And, uh, <laughs> You know, they'd write back and be like, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. And I like, I think it's hilarious. Like, so for me, that was a real eye opening experience because, you know, out of those million people who downloaded the book and were writing me all these messages, they didn't even know. I didn't make reference to my gender in the post. Right. And I think it just speaks to your level of, of passion about the subject and writing, you know, is like that. It's all about what you're interested in and how passionate you are. And, you know, anyone can do it. Right, right. Even the unicorns. Even, even, <laughs> even the unicorns can, yeah, yeah. No, it's like, uh, yeah, you know, today I think, um, uh, just to, not to get too deep into it though, but I, I think that social media in particular kind of highlights the the worst in people a lot of times. And you see these things becoming issues that aren't particularly issues, like you said. It's like, you you know, when you when you put your thing up on Imager, people responded to it because it was something good, because they, they found value in it. And they didn't really, it wasn't about you being a woman or a man or anything like that. So it was just the value of the work spoke for itself. So whereas right. we see, you know, there are times when people want to make issues about, well, you know, this happens because you're a male or a woman or whatever. But yeah, you know, it's like, yeah, do good work and you'll see results. And, and obviously what you have done is proof positive of that. So, you know kudos and cheers and all those good things and happy unicorn stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it's great so though. Much. Yeah. Oh, it's excellent. Um, I guess, well, we kind of, I was going to ask you, what was your greatest success uh, so far? But I would say that was probably a pretty big success. But if there's, is there anything else that you would um, be like, oh yeah, this is just like the hugest thing for me? Yeah. Um, definitely. I mean, everything is like baby steps forward and, you know, every success that you get along the way, there's always good things that happen and sometimes not so good things you go forward and backwards but there's been a lot of really great things and uh, one of the actually things in my mind that is a huge success was when I was contacted by some teachers in Florida who decided to use arena mode as part of their curriculum for the grade 10 class and they really? were, teaching, were teaching my books to their kids in high school and this was like so personal to me and so just amazing and they did a, a course about the book and they ended up writing a project at the end and the teachers actually sent me some of the kids had written me letters Aww. and really yeah and I Aww, this touched wow. me, like, so deeply I just love that that is going on and they're teaching you know arena mode in the books you know all my books in that special class it just makes me feel really good well now I gotta I ask would imagine so yeah well, now I gotta ask: Is that is that somewhere around your desk, or is that like in a very nice box in your closet? All those letters. Oh, the letters! No, I keep them actually next to me. There in you go. My folder, yeah. And anytime I'm having, I'm having a bad day, sometimes I swear I flip through, and they always make me smile. Oh, man, they, that's awesome. Yeah, that is, that is very cool. That is very cool. It's because it's one thing. It's one thing to put something into the world, but when you actually get that kind of feedback, when you actually see that you're affecting people. Yeah. That is that is a powerful thing. That is a very powerful thing. That's it great. Is. Yeah. Oh man. Wow. I feel like I feel like we should end on this happy note, but we've got so much more to talk <laughs> about though. It's just like I'm so glowy right now. I'm like, oh, I'm so inspired. So I mean, you, you kind of wandered around around the point uh, just by talking about your experiences. But what would be your advice to anyone who wants to sort of make a go at writing comics? Um, I guess. I mean, I kind of stumbled into comics, mm -hmm. like. You know, I, I always love comics, but I was really at the point where I was trying for probably a good five years to get in. It wasn't happening. So 
that's when I started writing my my latest novel. Mm -hmm. And I was really making peace with it in my own mind to say, you know what, it hasn't happened in comics. My success has been more in novels, so I'm going to go that way. And right when I kind of let it go to the universe uh, is when I got this opportunity with Fathom. So I'm a big believer in um, putting things out to the universe and, you know, just focusing positive energy on what you want and putting it out there. So I think that, you know, if you can uh, investigate, like I talked about before, like honing your craft, Mm -hmm. doing the classes, just trying to become the best, use your skills to become the best writer you can, and then see where it goes and do the networking. I mean, social media now is so huge. You really, like, even I have to invest time every day into my social media because those are the people that um, read my work and that, you know, kind of lift me up. And I really, I, ch- I kind of cherish that that aspect of it because the marketing side and um, having the, that support system from social media is so important now. And I think if you can get out there and build that, that community of support and people around you, it's really important. Awesome. Well then, uh, you know, and that leads right into the next thing. Do you do uh do you actually get out and do a lot of conventions or uh in um like events and things like that? Is that a component of what you do generally? Oh, for sure it is. Um now the hard part for me is that I live in tr- near near Toronto. So, uh you know, we do have a big fan expo that comes once once a year here and yeah, I, I was going to say the Toronto show is pretty big. Yeah. It's big and I try yeah. to go, you know, when I can. Um but the other thing is a lot of the other um comic cons are hard to get to if you're not being invited they tend they tend to want to invite the artists or right. cosplayers right yeah. so the, you know, it's not always about the writer so um this year i'm really lucky though i'm working with aspen and they've been amazing and they've just let me know i'm going to be heading out to san diego this year oh shit yeah oh. Damn, you hit the big legs, girl. <laughs> no, I'm excited. I'm nervous. I'm excited. That's great. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. I've been once before, but it was only for a day, and it was uh, to attend a uh, a Hollywood movie premiere, actually, for Mark Miller's Kick Ass Two. So uh, this time I'll be going to the the con, and I'm really excited. I'm, I'm That's trying. Excellent. I'm trying really hard not to be a negative Nancy about Comic Con. I mean, what you're doing is <laughs> awesome, but I was. Like, growing up, I'd gone to Comic-Con a, at least 11 times. And yeah. I saw how San Diego... So, why did I say that? It's so weird. I saw <laughs> I saw how San Diego, like, grossly profited off it. So, I'm, I'm a little sour, but that's awesome you're going. I'm glad that, that, you've, that you've, you've got that, that milestone. I'm going to strongly advise you not buy anything from the convention center. <laughs> Oh, really? It's over. Yeah. It's, I've, it's absurd. <laughs> I, and this is the thing I've heard from the other artists um, that I've talked to, you know, and two other writers. They said that's the thing with San Diego now is that it's yeah. so huge. And the focus has really shifted a little bit to be more more about entertainment in general, not yeah. just comics. Yeah. Right. So it's like the mother of all cons. And I get that. It's huge. It's not just about comics. Um, it now used we're, to be. Yeah, I'm, I'm obviously I'm excited to go because I'll be part of a team and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we're promoting our book, which is so exciting. But I understand, like, you know, the smaller cons, too, they kind of have a more personal appeal and you get maybe more of the focus back on comics. You're going to have a grand time, though. You're going to have so much fun. I already, yeah, know, it. I already know it. I think it'll be good. <laughs> you guys will see all about it. I'll be posting all over oh, social media yeah. and it'll be boring everyone to death. So <laughs> yeah, it'll be all over the place. Oh, please do. No, that's great. See, that. See, that's the fun thing. We can live vicariously through you, so that's yeah, great. Yeah, sure, sure. Great. And I'll, also, <laughs> <laughs> I'll also be attending the Toronto one with, with Aspen this year as well, and that runs the end of August yeah. to September 3rd. Man, you know what? I remember um, when uh, Toronto, God, when I, was, uh, when I was a teenager, way, way back when, um, fucking, uh, excuse me, uh, when I was a teenager, way back when, um, Toronto Con was something me and my friend Tony, you know, we were like, oh, my God, we need to go to Toronto Con because that was like that was that was still when when San Diego Comic Con was kind of growing. But Toronto was like like a really big deal because we we're on the East Coast. We we're like, dude, we can just shoot up the East Coast, hit New York, go to Boston, go over to Toronto, hang out. And so we actually never ended up getting there, unfortunately. But like that was always like kind of one of our holy grail trips that we never got to make, unfortunately. So I envy you again for that because oh, yeah. that was like always one of those things I wanted to do. So last time oh, yeah. I was there, I was hanging out with Dave Johnson, and we were 
Oh, and, uh, so you got to rub it in. Keep rubbing it in. That's fine. Oh, no, I just wanted to say we were at the, uh, we were going over dinner and it was yeah. funny because we look over at the bar and he's like, oh my gosh, that's Garth Ennis. I was oh, like, yeah? just sitting like literally like almost next to us. Then mm. we come out of the, the bar where we were, which was attached to the Sky Dome. And I ran into Linda Hamilton. Oh. And she took a picture of me. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, we're literally rubbing elbows with, like, famous people. It was so crazy. Nice. So, yeah, I thought that was really fun. Nice, nice. Yeah, Garth Ennis, he's, he's kind of a big deal, that guy. He does. Yeah. He's, he, people know who he is. He's done some work. <laughs> yeah. If I wanted to rub it in, I'd be telling you guys about the Playboy party I went to for. Oh, uh, there you go. That was pretty fun. Well, why don't you? I mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got time. Yeah. All right, I'll tell you this one last story. I won't. I promise. After that, I'll stop. Um, oh, no, no, that's why you're here. That's what we want to talk because you have stories. You're this is infinitely, great. Yeah. you're infinitely more interesting than we are, and plus, yeah. our audience can listen to us in like every week. So don't worry, right. go nuts. <laughs> All right. Well, I only have time for one more story. So here, okay. I'll tell you this one. This is a pretty good one. Um, so Mark Miller is my mentor, and I told you I was writing for him, and uh, you know I'd never met him though because he lives in Scotland with his wife, or sorry, his partner and their children. Mm -hmm. So uh, he doesn't come out all the time, and he was. This was when Kickass Two was coming out, mm -hmm. and uh, he invited me to come to San Diego to spend the day at Comic Con, and then at night there was going to be this huge block party in San Diego, um, and it was an outdoor event, and it was going to be the launch for Kick-Ass. And it was a very exclusive thing to get on this list, you know, it was celebrities and everything. And I'm, you know, I'm out here in remote. I live 45 min minutes away from Toronto, so I'm kind of like, kind of like a country girl-ish. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't really, like, I get to the city sometimes, but I don't live in the city. So mm -hmm. uh, this was back in 2013. And um, so anyway, I hopped on a plane and went down there, and it was amazing. I spent the day with comic book girl 19 is one of my friends so i spent the day with her oh yeah i know who she is yeah yeah we were hanging out at the con which is fun and then at night i went to this party so i get there and it was co-sponsored by playboy so i get to this party and it's all like what you imagine for you know thinking of what a hollywood blockbuster you know movie premiere would be there was this right. huge scaffolding that was set up like probably as high as an, a building and they had um it was on fire at the top and they had <laughs> Stunt people jumping off of it, doing stunts like off this scaffolding. There was of course. why a, wouldn't they? I mean, a yeah. bar. The bar was all set up with a huge aquarium behind it that had sharks in it. It was a shark tank. So you know there is all like velvet ropes where they were like sectioning off the celebrities. And I'm from I'm good friends with um, Christopher Mintz Class's father. Mm -hmm. So. He plays, um, he's in the movie Kick-Ass, and he plays uh, Red Mist, the Red Mist yeah. character. Or so, the motherfucker. As, motherfucker, as, yes. Yeah. So, as some might know him as, yes. Yeah, he's also McLovin. I don't know if you've seen those other yeah, movies. Yeah, so. yeah super bad, yeah. All right. So anyway, I was hanging out with his parents, and uh, we were, they invited me to come to the sectioned off celebrity side of things, where, you know, where Mark Miller was. So I went over there. Now I'm a normal everyday girl. I haven't, I don't hang around celebrities every day. So I was one of those crazy fangirls, you know, where I'm <laughs> sitting next to, to Julie Benz. I'm just like staring at her. Like she probably oh. thought she was some crazy wacky woman. And uh, I ended up meeting Nathan Fillion was there. Um, nice. I got a selfie with him. He was all drunk and like hitting on everybody. And <laughs> this, <laughs> there was, I, there was like half naked bunnies playboy bunnies were giving out shots of the red mist drink they created this drink for the party so mm -hmm. everybody was like getting pictures with the playboy bunnies and yeah it was just it was madness like the craziest night ever right. and so much fun so much fun I, I, I had, that was my experience last time going to san diego so nice. we'll see if it compares this time I had a similar experience when I went to Sundance uh, in the early 2000s. It was just ridiculous. It was just absolutely ridiculous. So I can I can kind of understand like when, yeah. when when there's lots of when, when the bar is open and everybody's having a good time, it gets silly. So now I get that. Oh yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Man. Good times, good times. Um, I'm just gonna have to take you guys' word for it. <laughs> yeah, we're high fluting folks here, Mark. Yep. Mm -hmm. One day, Mark. One day you'll get there. That's all right. Um, Let's talk about you. You 
briefly touched on it, but you didn't really get into much of the specifics or anything um, as far as like TV and, and and film and stuff. But you were working on a project called Luna at one point. Whatever happened with that? Um, actually, that was uh, so when I was when my first book came out um, <laughs> versus reality, that series, I was speaking with I've got in touch with a um, kind of like a producer in Hollywood who said they were interested in optioning it for potential. Right pre-production or whatever they say right, right yeah, yeah. so um i kind of worked with them on that and it was something that was very low-key and sort of one of those things where it was just in the beginning stages um and it was in pre-production for several years so i have no idea what what state it is in now um with luna I, honestly i'm not really in touch with them anymore that was just something that i kind of did right at the beginning Okay, so then it just never really kind of never uh, materialized then. Yeah, Hollywood like yeah. to move very slowly with these things. With they option it and then they want to, you know, it can right, take yeah. years, right? So I have no idea what stage they're at with that. Yeah, because optioning, uh, you know, when you when you talk about that, it's like, oh, you optioned it, but basically, it's like we want to make sure that we own this thing so nobody else can have it, kind of thing is the way a lot of that stuff. But you actually got into some like pre-production type stuff though early yeah, on. Yeah, it's kind of stuck in like some sort of development hell zone right oh, now. I don't really that's... know. <laughs> right, right. I'm not up to date on that. Okay, okay. This is something I wanted to know. Um, was that did you ever have the occasion to meet Michael Turner? No, I didn't. No? And, you know, okay. So many people, um, like everybody who talks about Fathom, they have such wonderful memories of what this book meant to them and what, right. you know, his artwork meant to them and just wonderful things to say. And that's one of my great regrets is that I didn't get to meet him because he sounds like such an amazing guy. And, um, you know, I just have nothing but respect for, for him and his work. Yeah, the, re the reason I asked, for those that don't know, um, Michael Turner, I believe it was 2008 when he passed away? I yeah. I think it was 2008. Um, I actually I actually had the occasion to meet him at a convention one time and talk to him for, you know, five or ten minutes or whatever it was. This is a very, just, you know, basic interaction. But seemed like a really lovely guy, and the, the fan base for the series has obviously been pretty strong over the years to the point where you're actually doing the series now. Um yeah. Uh, how how did that? Well, let me ask you about that. How did that come about? As far as you getting on the book Fathom, um, was that something like a passion project that you wanted to do specifically, or it just it was a matter of happenstance? I mean, I've always loved Fathom. I yeah. remember, you know, I was collecting it back, you know, in the two thousands and everything. But I ended up being on social media um, on my Facebook, and I was friends with. Um, Vince Hernandez and at the time I didn't like connect the dots that he was an editor <laughs> and ask, you know, I have so many people like there's like 5,000 friends on my Facebook I don't know what everyone does as a job right, right. so um, I guess he had been following me and my success and my writing and things like that for a couple of years because he knew all about my book in arena mode and he was just very he wrote to me and said you know we're looking at new writers possibly coming on board and we were really interested in knowing if you'd be interested in working with us and he didn't mention what the title was at the time I mean obviously right. when I found out he was from Aspen I was like oh my gosh could he be talking about Fathom no no he cannot be. <laughs> like no no I'm just thinking like it has to be something else but you know he was amazing like I have to say right away he was like no I feel like you'd be a great fit for this voice um, you know I really think you'd be able to do a good job and he was just so supportive um, because I hadn't written, um, other than working with, Mar um, sorry, I worked with uh, Mark Miller a little bit in comics, but I had never written a comic before. So uh, this was a huge leap of faith he was taking to back me and to really go to the mat for me. And I think that it took me, you know, five seconds at least to accept, you know, his offer because I was just like, what the heck? Oh, my gosh. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So no, exciting. that's got to be a pretty, yeah, that's got to be a pretty, like, it's like, what, what? <laughs> One of those double take moments where you kind of like shake your head and go, I, 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 I. <laughs> it was just a matter of timing, too, because I had just finished writing my, my latest novel. So, uh, you know, I, I was kind of in this mode of what am I going to do next? Am I going to keep writing novels? Am I going to give up on comics now? Because I hadn't had any offers, right? Mm -hmm. And I've been trying so hard to get into them. I thought, well, maybe this is meant to be that I'm just meant to go into novels now. And then all of a sudden, this offer came up, and I had the time to really be able to focus on it and devote to writing Fathom. So it was it was great timing. 
Okay, right on. Um, okay, there's there's one thing I want to ask you, and 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 I'm just curious about this. I was I was looking online at like some preview pages and stuff, and there were some things in the first issue of Fathom. Uh, there's a character in the the first issue, a um, uh, 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 young lady with blonde hair, who is uh, who is introducing Fathom to the to the internet, I believe, at one point, talking about like her showing up on social media. That's not anybody that we might know, is it? No, no. This this young lady with blonde hair. That's not anybody that might be uh, that might be uh, in our general vicinity right now during this interview, perhaps. Oh, it wasn't. It wasn't meant to be me. No. Oh, it wasn't really. No. Oh, I thought for sure it was. <laughs> ah, dang. I thought I, I was getting I a told, scoop. I told him it wasn't. <laughs> but he's like, I gotta ask her. I gotta ask her. There are, I definitely use social media though in my work, definitely. And um, I have been making reference to people who right. might be. May or may not I, say, be. I don't want to say who they are, but they might be online for, you know, or characters that are. We get it. To we get it. You want the plausible online. deniability just in case someone yeah. gets cheesed. <laughs> <laughs> it's not supposed to be me, you know. Uh, you mean the you mean the 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 very famous YouTubers in the fandom universe? You mean those folks? Yeah. That may or may not be based on people in real life. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, little Easter eggs there. No, I thought that I thought that was cute. I actually got a real good, a big kick out of that. I thought that was funny. That's um, one thing that people have been mentioning to me, um, and online there's been some discussion about is that the use of the social media in the run of Fathom. So I'm glad that people can take away from it and enjoy it and kind of take it for what it is. Right. So that's great. Well, I mean, it, you know, it makes the world feel more more alive when you put these kind of things that people can be like, I don't want to say it's a, um, not like a cultural touchstone per se, but it's it's something that it, it's like, oh wait, this is this has got more of a living feel to it at that point. It feels a little bit more grounded, even though it is a very fantastical world, though. So, right. Yeah, I think I think those little touches are nice. They're homey little touches, I think. So. Well, I've always been a huge fan of Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns. And right. how he used little TV screens as panels, yeah. reporters kind of pushing that narrative forward with their updates. I really wanted to do something similar, but update it for the current year by integrating, you know, alternative new, news sources in there. So people, you know, they don't sit in front of their TVs anymore to, concern, to consume their news. And they get it from YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. So I really wanted, you know, my story arc to reflect that. Right, you, know? right. you literally stole the words out of my mouth. I was going to bring up those comics. Yeah. So I thought that was uh, an interesting kind of throwback. No, it is for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it, the nice little touches like that really ground it and really kind of get people a foot in the door, as it were, I think, for sure. Mm -hmm. So, well, Blake, uh, Blake Northcott, where can folks find you online if they were so inclined to do so? Uh, actually, I have a website. So you can go to my website, which is blakenorthcott.com. And it has all of my social media there. You can find it. Uh, links to my books. Um, you know, my handle online is at comic book girl, G R R L. So I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, I'm all over the place. Cool. Excellent. Um, yeah, well, then let me, let me give you the last word then as, as it were, and, and ask if there are any words of wisdom you'd like to impart on us and our audience, uh, before we, before we say good day. Words of wisdom. Hmm. Not to put you on the spot or anything, of course. I <laughs> usually tell them something stupid. Don't worry. <laughs> just live long and prosper i guess just hey there you go <laughs> oh that's great that's great um you know once again blake thank you very much for you know giving us uh, a bit of your time today to talk and um hopefully maybe sometime in the future when you're doing some new projects we can get you back on to, to you know do a little do a little shilling a little talking a little tell little us what that's all about and forth yeah tell us what that's, that's all about yeah definitely exactly. thank you for having me on guys it's been great Thanks for stopping by. If you enjoyed this episode of Entertaining Guests, please like, subscribe, and share links to our show on places like Reddit, Twitter, Facebook, and other social media sites you enjoy. Every week, Big and Robot strives to bring you entertaining and insightful content which can be enjoyed on a variety of platforms. From SoundCloud to iTunes, vid.me to YouTube, there are many different ways to connect with our content. If you enjoy our content and would like to support Big and Robot, consider becoming a patron on patreon.com. You'll find links to our Patreon page in the description below. Have a question, comment, or business inquiry? Check below for links to our social media accounts as well as our email address where you can contact us directly. Thanks again for stopping by, and we'll see you next time.